Hello and welcome to another video, or welcome if you're new here, it's great to have you. Today I'm going to tell you about all of the books that I read in August. At the end of July I did a video, you may have seen it, if not I will drop a link to it below, where I went through all of the books on my shelves because I have a plan to try and read all of the unread books on my shelves by the end of the year. The ones that I don't read I'm going to donate to a charity shop and get rid of. I just don't really like having lots of unread books on my shelves so that's my plan and if you didn't see that video you would have missed me picking my TBR for August so I went through and identified that I've got about 50 books which I really really want to read or have to read for my studies and I want to do that by the end of 2023 and I forgot the year then and what I picked was 10 books that I kind of were a mixture of books that I'd been wanting to read for a while or rather that I have to read and books that I thought might be nice for the summer. So these are the 10 books that I said that I wanted to read in August and I read three of them. However all 10 are off my TBR because I DNF'd the rest of them. I also managed to read one book that wasn't on this pile as well, which I will talk about at the end. I was seriously considering not filming a wrap up of what I read in August because it feels like this is going to be a really negative video, but I do have some things to say about some of these books. I am hoping to try and film weekly catch ups or weekly wrap ups. Or something like that. It's something that I've always wanted to do and I've tried and just things get in the way and life gets in the way but I really really want to do it so I'm determined to try and post a video a week. Sometimes they will be catch-ups of what I've done that week and what I've read or sometimes they might be other things. I am about to go away on a research trip. I have to go to Manchester. Um, if you haven't watched my last video which was all about my PhD I will also link to that because that kind of explains why I'm going to Manchester. So Let's get on with this. What did I read out of this massive pile? And what did I do enough? So we're going to start with, oh, don't you? I'm going to move these over here. There are four First World War books. I read two of these and I DNF'd the other two. The first thing that I DNF'd, I could have predicted that this was going to happen, was the poetry of Rupert Brooke. I feel like the world is separated into people who really love Rupert Brooke's poetry and people who just think he's insufferable. I, I tabbed a couple of them. There's literally two poems I liked in here and I read about half of them, but he is just insufferable and I just couldn't. There is a poem of his called The Great Lover, which was the bit that kind of, it's only on page 16. I didn't realise it was so early on. It kind of tipped me over the edge a little bit and this is where I put a tab in. So that's not even a poem I liked. I think I tabbed one poem. Home, I liked that one. Um, so The Great Lover starts... I have been so great a lover. Of course you have, dear. I mean, you should read his biographies. They're very interesting. There is a bit, though, where he says, let me just find out. So he's talking about the people whom he has loved. And he, that's a quote here directly. Whom I have loved, who have given me, dared with me, high secrets, and in darkness knelt to see the inenerable godhead of delight. Now, I did have to look up the word inenerable, not a word I was familiar with. I think it means like awe-inspiring. But they're kneeling before him to see the inenerable godhead of delight. He is talking about his penis, isn't he? No, no, thank you. I also DNF this, which is actually a um, brilliant book, really fantastic. So this is The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914 by Christopher Clarke. This book is absolutely massive. That's not why I DNF'd it. If you are really interested in First World War history, this book is brilliant because it doesn't talk about why the war started. It talks about how. So that's a very, very different thing, I think. And sometimes these things get confused. But how it actually happened, how the different personalities and different countries and different factions all kind of worked together or didn't in order to start the war. This is really interesting, but I got it because I just wanted a bit of background reading whilst doing my PhD 
and this, there is just too much detail in this and I don't need this level of detail and I got about halfway through it. The font is absolutely tiny, the book is massive and I just thought you know I've got so many other things I have to read as well. This is just not really working for me at the moment so I kind of, I'm going to move everything out of the way so I can pile these books here but um, I just... I just stopped reading it, but I, I would really recommend this. So this is Christopher Clark, The Sleepwalkers, if you are interested in First World War history, um, have a go of that. The next thing that I read was these two. So these are both um, First World War memoirs, although one of them is an actual memoir and one of them is a fictional memoir that's actually real. We'll get to that in a moment. But Edmund Blunden's Undertones of War and this absolutely terrible cover of Siegfried Sassoon's Memoirs of an Infantry Officer. I think that if you were interested in reading a First World War memoir, you may fall into one of two categories. I mean, there may be many categories, but you might be the kind of person who really wants lots of detail about life in the trenches during the First World War in France, um, what officers got up to, what they did, specifically whilst they were out the front line. And in that case, Edmund Blunden's memoir is probably of most interest. Memoirs of an Infantry Officer is Sassoon's second memoir following, what's it called? Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man, I think it is. And then it's followed up with Sherston's Progress. This is the only one of those that I've read. I don't think you need to read the others. But this actually, I think, works really well to go from Sassoon explaining his feelings about the war from being quite not optimistic about it because he's not at the beginning but more or less in favour of it to be quite anti-war towards the end and the book finishes just as he goes into Craig Lockhart war, war hospital. Um, it has a lot more in here though about what it's like being back in Britain during the war so it, Sassoon was invalided out of the front several times because he kept getting himself shot in the head um, so like he does go back a fair bit and he does talk about that whereas Blunden doesn't really talk very much about going back home and what it's like back in England he seems to get us back to France very very quickly I think that Blunden's one is not written in the most engaging way which I thought was interesting because I've read a lot of his letters and I find him such an interesting person but his prose I love his poetry as well his poetry is great and this edition has lots of poetry at the back of it it's just not engaging though, it's just not interesting. Sassoon is a much better writer, much better prose writer. I don't really like Sassoon's poetry. We'll come to that for my TBR for next month, but I don't really like it, but I love his prose writing. This is, as I said, it's a fictionalised memoir, but the only thing that's fictionalised is that he's changed people's names. He changes his own name and then makes it like it's a fiction book, but it's all real, because if you know anything about Sassoon or if you've read any biographies, you'll know that it's real. If you don't, I can tell you, it's all real. Um, I think one interesting thing about Sassoon is that in a lot of his letters, he talks about how people don't really need to know what the life of a poet is. They don't need to know about the intimate details of a person's life. They just need to be able to read their poetry and that should say enough. And I wonder if that has something to do with why he initially didn't want his name on this memoir as as being his story what in a way that he wanted to kind of pretend that it wasn't but it is it is his story he, he does leave significant chunks out of it and maybe again that's why he chose to fictionalize it i don't know but it's very very interesting so those are the first world war books that i read um i then there was one other non-fiction yeah let's do that now which i dnf'd and this was a big shock that i dnf'd it and a big disappointment and that is a sultry month by alethea hater subtitled scenes of a london literary life in 1846. Now, I saw this on the shelf in the bookstore, I remember seeing it, and entirely based on the cover, I thought I want to read that. So, and the cover and the title, because the person on the front of here, she's, she's got a happy smiley face, can you see that, can you see that, that happy smiley face, um, she's wearing a lovely dress, she seems to be quite chilled out, there's some beautiful pastoral scenes there, and a sultry month would, I don't know, I think it's a quite a light-hearted title it certainly gives that impression now the blurb on the inside does actually explain um, that it features the death of uh, Benjamin Robert Hayden who commits suicide and it's about all these other people so people like Elizabeth Barrett, uh, Robert Browning, Wordsworth, Dickens, the Carlyles and how their kind of lives intersect around around Hayden but was it Hayden? 
Hayden. Hayden? Anyway, um, that, that description doesn't make it seem maybe a little bit darker than the cover would appear. But it's an incredibly dark book. It's very grim. The description of him killing himself is very detailed. And apparently the whole book is based on letters and diaries from from those people and none of it is made up it's all completely based on um, factual information but th the one thing i would say is that the cover kind of doesn't give you the right impression of what the actual content of the book is the second thing that i would say is that it's just really badly written i just really didn't like it i was quite bored um so then i have left one two three four five good yes i can count um i have five fiction books three of which I DNF'd. Um, I have probably the least to say about this one, so I'm going to talk about this one first, and that is Lika Marsman's The Opposite of a Person, which is translated by Sophie Collins. Um, this book is about someone who's a climatologist and accepts an internship at a research institute in the Italian Alps, leaving behind her girlfriend. Um, it's a novel about global warming, um, about vulnerability, introspection, I did not like the writing style, it's just not for me. I'm sure other people would love it, but it's just absolutely not for me. I'm going to donate this to a charity shop or give it away to anyone who wants it. But I just I just found the main character insufferable and not in a nice way. And I just really, it just wasn't for me. I didn't really like it at all. And the next book I DNF, which again was another surprise, uh, was The Gallery by John Horn, John Horn Burns. This is one that I picked for the queer TBR tackle because it had been on my shelves for quite a while and the reason I got this book is because not just because I was told by Greg that this is what the book was about but because it's what it says on the back so this is of course anyone would think it was what it says on the back so it does actually say that it is about uh or that it represents rather gay life in the military during the second world war it's by someone who was in the military in the second world war that's not what the book is really about and I feel like the publisher I think is the New York Review of Books yep I feel like it's, they're trying to sell it as something that it isn't yes it does depict that but that seems to be like the big selling point of this and I feel like they should maybe emphasize the fact that it's really not so I'll describe kind of briefly how how it kind of sets itself up and the structure of it because it might be that lots of people are interested in it the book is told in alternating chapters so every other chapter is a different story of a different person they're kind of like little short stories of people who were in Naples or in North Africa and um, which is where John Hornburns was deployed during the Second World War but these characters are in these different places and it's just about, about what they see it's about their lives during the war and their experiences and then the alternating between that are these chapters which seem to be written from the perspective of the author it does seem to be that they are his story those chapters are quite meandering and they don't really then they don't really make sense it's not really clear what's going on or who's talking you work it out after a while but they don't fit with what the other chapters are and maybe they do towards the end but it does make it feel like a bit of a disjointed collection of stories rather than a novel apparently there is one chapter where we do get the gayness and that's fully represented but i didn't get to that point because i couldn't be bothered so i didn't want to read i was just really bored there is just so many books i want to get through and so many wonderful books and I'm going to reflect on that in a moment but I'm going to talk about another DNF and this one was really a shock for me and really quite disappointed but this is Doris Lessing's The Summer Before the Dark. Now I've read a few Doris Lessing short stories and I think that Doris Lessing is one of the best writers in the English language. I think she's absolutely phenomenal and the thing about her stories is that she does this amazing thing and she does it in this book too where she tells you so much without actually telling you it at all and you get to the end of a page and you think how have I found out so much that you didn't actually tell me anything you don't quite understand how she's done it and it's just it's truly amazing and it's really really wonderful how she does it but I think the problem is that this book feels a little bit like it should be a short story it feels a little bit like she's taken a short story idea and just kind of you know lengthened it just kind of 
squeezed it out a little bit into a novel and it doesn't really work for me um the novel is about a woman who it seems that when she was younger she had a very full and vibrant life she spoke multiple languages she really could have done absolutely anything with her life but she got married and had children and that kind of changed everything for her um and sort of i was gonna say ruined everything but i guess that is the right way of saying it it was um first published in 1973 but this woman, one summer, kind of realises that no one really needs her anymore. Her children are going away. They don't re really intend to come back that summer and they don't really need to be around. And her husband is going away and he decides that because there's not going to be anyone in the house, except for his wife, who he seems to have forgotten exists, but because no one is going to be around, they're just going to rent their house out to house sitters for the whole summer. So she's like, well, where do I go? What do I do? And she ends up getting a job. But that takes a really long time to get there. And I think an affair then happens after that. But it just took such a long time to get there. And I was actually quite bored, which for Doris Lessing, maybe I need to revisit this at some point when, when I don't know. I don't know. But I just, I just got really bored and I didn't want to pick it up. And then I forgot that I was reading it. And I actually just left it and picked up another book, book because I actually thought... Oh, I'm not reading anything at the moment because I completely forgot about it. So that seems really weird that I would forget that I was reading the Doris Lesson book because she's absolutely amazing. But I don't know. It just wasn't working for me at all. So I have two books left to talk about from that TBR. The first is one that I didn't really like that much. And I feel like this is quite, again, a shock to me because everyone who's read it seems to really like it. <clears throat> but that's uh, Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner. Lolly Willows is a woman who is quite young when we first meet her in the novel. And then it does jump through many kind of decades of her life. But she's someone who just kind of meanders through life in a very kind of haphazard fashion and just is quite content to be led places by people and essentially pushed around, I think, by people. But she decides one day that she's just going to move to a random village in the countryside and take up witchcraft and it is intriguing but I think that description of the book is as it describes it on the back and it does make it seem a little bit more whimsical than the book actually is and it's I don't think this book has any whimsy whatsoever I think that was the reason why I didn't really connect with it because I was expecting a book that was a little bit more tongue-in-cheek a little bit more wry humour and maybe a little bit more whimsy and it just doesn't have that at all. It is a very short book and it is very very intriguing to read. If you're doing Shorty September this might be a good one. I don't know which um, a prompt you would match it to but it is a really intriguing and interesting book but I think don't go into it expecting any form of whimsy um, because it's just not there. Um, it is quite dark in places as well, but I'm really glad that I finally read it. I just didn't love it as much as I was expecting to. Okay, so the the last book of that TBR that I want to talk to you about is actually a book that I absolutely loved. Thank God. There was only one book that I read in August out of, I was going to say the 10 that I read, that's not true, out of the 10 that I was supposed to read and mostly DNF'd. Um, and this is Persephone book number four and Fidelity by Susan Glaspell. I'm just thinking now as I speak that maybe I should do a whole video review of this and maybe I should do a video review of every Persephone book I read and then maybe I could rank them because I feel like this book is probably in like my top three Persephone books that I've read so far. If you'd be interested in that let me know. I, I would be amenable to doing that video. Um, or videos. There's a lot of them. There's like 150 books. I haven't read them all. I could though. I do have some reading plans for next year that that would fit in with. I'm not going to read all the Persephone books, that's insane. Um, not a year anyway. But I could read some of them. Anyway, back to Fidelity. So I will say before I start talking about this that I went into this book knowing nothing about it. The only reason I picked it up is that it was published in 1915. And I thought, I assumed that it was probably a British book. So it might have something to do with the war, or even if it was written before, it'd be an interesting kind of you know time period for it to be published. It's actually American though. And I think when she was writing the novel, or maybe before it was published, I think the book had already been written when the war happened because it's kind of inserted in in really awkward moments where 
they were they had difficulty because some people go to Europe and then there's a mention of they had difficulty coming back from Europe because of the war. It kind of felt like it was shoved in there at the last minute. Um, but that was all I knew. So if you like to go into Persephone books knowing absolutely nothing about them, there'll be a timestamp below for when I start talking about Jessamyn Ward's books, which is what I'm going to do next. Um, but if not, I, will, I won't give you any spoilers, but I will tell you that this book is about a young woman called Ruth who starts an affair with a married man. And it's told from a third person, but quite close perspective. So we get to see multiple different people and we get to be really inside of their head. And essentially what this book is about is about society's expectations on everyone, but mostly on women and the way that they behave and the things that they do. And it's about how people try and push against those expectations, but then sometimes conform to them, even when they're trying to step away from them. And it's just brilliant. I mean, it's so well written. It's so engaging. I loved all of the characters. I mean, some of them were awful, but as in awful people, but just really interesting. It was really fascinating getting kind of under their skin. I, I just, yeah, I, I, there are no words as to how great I just thought this was. I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, probably in my top two Persephone books. No, maybe, maybe. So the last thing that I want to talk about, I've got so many piles of books around me here, but the last thing that I want to talk about um, that I read in August is uh, Jessamyn Ward's Sing Unburied Sing. So a few months ago, I got hold of a copy of Letters Descend, which is her new novel, which is out in October in the UK. But I hadn't actually read any of her books before. So I decided that I wanted to read not just her fiction, but her nonfiction as well. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get round to reading her nonfiction. I just ran out of time. But I did manage to read all of her novels. So I read Where the Lion Bleeds, which was her first novel, um, followed by Salvage of the Bones and then Sing on Buried Sing, which I finished um, on the last day of August, which was yesterday. <laughs> but I thought it was really interesting. If you've never read her novels before, I would recommend reading them in publication order. You might know if you've been around for a while. I am obsessed with doing that, reading books in publication order. But it's really interesting to read them and see the evolution of someone's style. And it's really interesting to read all of the novels by one person, especially in close proximity, because it really shows you some interesting themes and stylistic choices that kind of go throughout the whole of all, all of their work. And I thought that was really interesting with Jessamyn Waters, that you can really see certain themes and certain uh, choices, shall we say, going throughout them. So one of the things that I noticed firstly is that her books are very very descriptive they go into quite interesting detail and quite kind of visceral sensorial um sometimes gruesome detail especially um salvage the bones but she talks quite a lot and describes quite a lot bodily fluids bodily messes um both of humans and animals and also kind of smells and touches all of the senses really but she describes those in quite intricate detail i think of her three novels i think my favorite is actually where the line bleeds i'm not going to describe them in any great detail because i really don't think i'm the right person to be reviewing these books but they they all center in they're all set in a, the same kind of fictionalized town and they all center the different lives of different families and they really tell almost like multi-generational in some ways stories and um, sometimes through multi-generations, multi-generations, multiple generations living in the same area or the same property, um, sometimes through magical realism, which is the thing that I really didn't like very much in Sing on Buried Sing. But they all have those kind of themes of family and there's very, very complex family issues and issues related to neighbours as well and people within your community. Your community both being the people immediately around you and the people in your country. I think that Where the Line Bleeds, I just thought was really exceptional, which was her debut novel, but I don't think you can tell it's a debut novel. And I actually think that of the three that, um, that I've read that she's written, I think that Where the Line Bleeds is for me the most successful. I really felt a connection with the characters. I really understood who they were. 
and I really felt like I got to the heart of what she was trying to say, like her message that she was trying to put across. I really felt that I understood that. And that's why I think that I'm not really the best person to review them because I don't think they were brilliant books, which I think means they're not books for me. And I think Jessamine Ward is probably the best example that I've read recently of someone who I can see is an absolutely brilliant writer, just like astonishingly good so talented but just not really my kind of writing i was trying to describe this actually uh to mary the other day and i think it's like if <sighs> there will be people who like all these kinds of novels but i feel like <laughs> in my head you're either a kind of person who likes jessamine ward or you prefer claire keegan and i don't mean as people obviously i just mean as writers and their writing style and if you've read both of them you'll kind of know what that means but I feel like Claire Keegan has this really kind of pared back simplified understated use of language and I feel like Jessamyn Ward has this really descriptive highly descriptive language I don't think it's ever overdone at any point and I don't think it's ever flowery I certainly read a lot of very flowery over, overly descriptive novels but it does have that kind of level of descriptive detail that just doesn't really suit me as a reader so whilst I absolutely um, loved Sing Unburied Sing on the level of writing like I thought this was brilliantly written it just it just didn't work for me as a story I just I just found myself not really connecting with what she was trying to say I thought that the use of magical realism, whilst I do actually like magical realism in books, I felt like there were points, I'm trying to say this without spoiling anything, which I think I'm doing quite successfully because I haven't described any of the novel, but there's a moment where, although magical realism is used throughout the book, there's a moment where it seems like it's being used in order to divert away from some quite complex human decisions about life and death, and I didn't really like the way it it did that I would have preferred to deal with those messy human emotions and decisions that had to be made and I felt like we could have delved a little bit deeper into that so that's really the only kind of um, my only criticism of that book but I, I really liked it and I'm really glad that I read all of her books so we're going to move quickly on now to my TBR for September so I've picked another 10 books from my shelves I do have quite a busy September coming up so I've picked a few that I'm pretty sure that my library have audiobooks so that when, for example, I have to drive up to Manchester uh, and then drive back again, I will be able to listen to at least one of these on audiobook. But obviously the first thing that I'm going to read is Jessamyn Ward's um, Letters to Send, which is out in October. I think this should be quite intriguing because her other books are all quite modern settings and this is a historical novel. And I believe it is about death and about grief. So I'm not really sure how I'm going to work with this at the moment. There was a bit of Sing Unburied Sing that I had to skip for that reason. Just like a paragraph. Um, but I'm going to try. The next thing I'm going to attempt to read in September is Christopher Isherwood's Christopher and His Kind. I believe that this is a memoir about Christopher Isherwood's time living in Berlin from 1929 to 1939, I think. So it's just that 10-year period. But it's written, it is a memoir, but it's written in the third person. And I've heard that he does keep slipping into first person as well. So I'm not quite sure how successful that will be, but I guess we will find out. The next thing I'm going to attempt to read in September is The Good Soldier by Ford Maddox Ford. This, I believe, is a novel that was published in 1915, but was written, dur no, not during, before the war started. So it is apparently narrated by a wealthy American who describes how him and his wife Florence met an English couple in a German spa resort and became friends. Something to do with the lie behind the orderly Edwardian facade. I'm quite intrigued by this so I think this should be quite interesting and I'm looking forward to getting around to that. Um, the next book I hope to read is Small Country by Gail Fay, which is it is a small book and why do I think this is translated? I think this might be. One moment. Yes it is, it's translated from the French by Sarah Ardazoni, I believe that isn't how you say it, but let's go with it. This is set in Burundi in 1992 and does reflect somewhat on the conflict that is happening in Rwanda, which is next door. 
So I've never read a book from Burundi, but I'm quite interested in reading this one. I picked this up because it was recommended to me by the staff at Mr B's in Bath when I went in there and asked them for the best book they'd read by an African author. And this was one of the books that they recommended. So I've been looking forward to getting around to this since they recommended that to me. Um, the next book I've spaced out the First World War book. <laughs> it's in my little pile here and I did this accidentally, but uh, the next book is another First World War memoir and that is Robert Graves' Goodbye to All That. The only thing I know about this memoir, aside from the fact that everybody seems to love it, is that the original version of this was destroyed after publication at the request of several people, but amongst them Siegfried Sassoon because of the things that Robert Graves said in it about Wilfred Owen. They caused, it was the thing that caused Edmund Blondin to refer to stuff that Robert Graves had said in his first version of this memoir as being a marmalade of lies. Um, but I've not actually read this book, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting around to it. The only other thing that I know about Robert Graves is from reading a lot of his letters. And he's very arrogant and I don't like him. I mean, I never met him. I'm sure he's lovely, but I'm looking forward to reading his memoir about the first world war. Uh, next on my potential, I really want to read this in September, is Good Behaviour by Molly Keane. I think it's about a family, one of those kind of like families, um, Edwardian, is it? Or maybe, um, oh, it's set in Ireland after, just after the First World War interesting um but it's about that kind of idea that you know there's more going on behind the scenes of this wealthy family you know that that kind of story i think that's what it's about um molly Keane is an author that i've never read but i've always wanted to so i'm really intrigued to read this and see what i think of that the next one is a book that i've been putting off for so long because it's supposed to be so hard and it's probably going to hurt my head but it's in parentheses by david jones this is a book which was first published in 1937 and it's about the experiences of a soldier in the 1418 war, which is what they all called it, by the way. If you read their letters after the war, they don't call it the First World War. And occasionally they call it the Great War, but they don't do that. They all call it the 1418 War. No one is interested in that other than me. Thanks, Jan. But I'm going to tell everyone anyway. So um, it's a book about war, but also about Roman Britain, the Arthurian legend and other diverse matters. But anyway, it's a kind of prose poem stream of consciousness i don't really know how to describe it i tried reading it once and it really hurt my head but i'm gonna try again i'm gonna try again okay um three books to go the next one is no one around here reads tolstoy memoirs of a working class reader by mark hodkinson so this is about a young boy who grew up in the north of england um, with no books in his house and he's now a very avid reader how do you get from a to b is essentially the story i think i bought this in my bookshop crawl again and um, then I heard some not very good things about it, as in it's a bit rubbish, but I'm pretty sure my library has an audiobook copy. So I might be able to, this might be a good book to listen to on the car journey up north because non-fiction is easier to listen to in the car. Two books to go, The War Poems of Siegfried Sassoon. This should be quite easy to get through. Um, I've already read quite a few of them. So I'm just going to read the ones that I haven't yet read. See, there's even a bookmark still in there. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Sassoon's poems. I prefer his prose and I prefer his letters. So um, I'm just going to have a quick read of that. The last one is for the E.M. Forster read along. It's the last Forster book or Forster novel that I haven't yet read. And that is A Passage to India. Again, I think I might have an audiobook of this, but the font is very small. I might listen to the audiobook, I don't know. So this is, like I said, the last one that I haven't yet read because in two months time uh, we, will, we will be reading Morris, which I have read. And I think I lent a copy to my friend, but I'm going to stay in his house when I go on my research trip. So I will be stealing that back from him because I don't think he's read it yet. I'm coming for my book, Michael. Um, okay, so that, that is, I'm threatening my friends who don't even watch my videos. Um, that is the books that I intend to read. Let's have a little look at this. Let me just put this the right way around. There we go. These, oh, <laughs> these are the books that I would like to read in September. If you've read any of these, do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I will try and film a little bit more regularly. Like I said, I am going away um, next week, which is the first week of September. And this video, I think, is going to be posted 
during the time that I'm away actually I'm going to try and schedule it and put it up but I am going to try and I think film a kind of maybe mid month wrap up so that if I do DNF most of these it doesn't have to be quite so negative next time around sorry about all the negativity um if you think maybe I should give some of these another go I mean don't tell me because I'm trying to get rid of these books but especially that Doris Lessing one I'm considering breaking my own rules and keeping that because I'm kind of disappointed that I didn't like it. Um, do let me know all of your thoughts on all of these books in the comments below. And until next time, thank you so much for watching.